and Deborah's disappeared. We're live. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel, the only astronomy meeting you're going to for the next couple of months. I um, hope everybody's doing fine. Uh, we were talking in the room here earlier, and well, we have lots of things to say about it and stuff like that. We're all fine and dandy and hanging in there, so I hope you are too. Uh, put your Purell away, take off your surgical masks. You should be safe particularly if you've got Norton, that should keep you clean up all those viruses. Tonight, uh, Agapio is back and he's gonna be telling us about planetary imaging. You might remember a couple of uh, weeks ago, he was here and he had a heck of a presentation prepared for us and uh, started telling us about it and had so many good things to tell us. We asked him if he could come back again today and tell us the rest of it. And so uh, if you've got any questions about last week, a couple of weeks ago it was program uh, where Agapio told us about how to acquire images. You can find, uh, Tolga is putting a website link. You can find that show in the website um, uh, from YouTube and you can go back and look at all that stuff. And if you have any questions, be sure for leftover from that um, presentation, be sure to type them in uh, to the comment section on YouTube and uh, Eric and Tolga and Terry will get them all back to um, um, Agapio so he can answer things. But tonight he's going to be telling us about the, the later part of that where he goes into processing and stuff. One of the things he talked about, <coughs> excuse me, and it's just a cough, it's just a cough. Got to get the Purell out. Um, one of the things he talked about during that was how he collimates using um, 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 mega, um, yeah. Anyway, um, Frank is going to be here. We talked to Frank and uh, he's going to be coming in and tell us all about that and how it works. And uh, we're real excited about that. He's going to be here on the 29th of March. Um, and next week, Deborah Sarabolo is going to be coming to us. Uh, Deborah is coming to us all the way from Canada and her um, uh, she's going to be talking about kind of her progress through uh, astroimaging. She was really into astroimaging a decade or so ago and did a lot of stuff. And then, you know, life caught up with her and she had to do this and had to do that and stuff like that. Now she's back into it. And she's, you know, it's a different world, she says. She says she's learned a lot of stuff about how people do things now. And she's gonna tell us about, um, well, she's gonna tell us about astroimaging 10 years after you know, how things have changed, how things have been updated, what she's learned about, how, how much better she can do things now and all that kind of stuff. So she's gonna be here on the 20, um, uh, she's gonna be here the 22nd. Frank's gonna um, be here on the 29th. And then our big show on April 5th was neat. We had a had time off. And then the week after that on um, April 12th, we were gonna talk about all the things we found at NEAP except we can't do that because, um, well, you know, because the virus thing. So we can't, we can't really talk about that. Um, so we have to get some alternative programs for you. And again, I mean, you guys got to believe it. We need presenters. You've got nothing to do. You can't go anywhere. You can't have your meetings. You can't do anything. Make up some presentations. Tell us about your progress through astroimaging. Find a, tell us about some your favorite program. We haven't had a program on, on a whole lot of stuff to, that's in astroimaging. And you know what? Some people, when I ask them if they, they would give a program, they say, um, you, you know, we've already had a program on that. But every time we give a program, even on the same subject, we come up with new things to talk about. Um, the presenter has a new take on something, or maybe he just explains it in just the right way that somebody else gets it and says, hey, that was a real good show. So please contact us um, at, here. Uh, you can find me on Cloudy Nights. You can get us on the website. Uh, contact us and volunteer to do a presentation. Okay, that's enough of an introduction. I think we're ready to go. Gapio, are you out there? You ready to take over? Uh-huh, absolutely. Okay, go for it. Okay, uh, let me just share my screen again. Okay, you guys seeing my screen? Yeah, you're good. Okay, 
So uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we talked about um, how we mm, how I acquire images. Um, we talked about fire capture and collimation. And now we're going to go into uh, the processing part. And we're going to start with AutoStacker. Um, obviously, the whole process is going to jump back and forth uh, I mentioned this last time, we're going to go through um, AutoStacker, we're going to go into stretching and sharpening, back to AutoStacker, back to uh, Registax for stretching and sharpening. We're going to jump into derotation, then back again to Registax, and we're going to finish up with Photoshop. Um, and and you'll, the, the reason for this is basically, uh, as I mentioned last time, uh, the seeing is never uh, consistent enough for really long periods of time. So what's happening? What's happening is, even though you get a prediction for good seeing, uh, for those of us who don't live in you know uh, exotic locations where you have the same kind of seeing over large extended periods of time, um, the seeing is always turbulent and changing, and you're going to get only a few short bursts of of good seeing. And with the process that I mentioned last time, um, acquiring large strings of data, what we're going to do is we're going to um, isolate those small periods of better seeing. And we're going to start by using AutoStacker. Um, so uh, the most important tool in AutoStacker is basically the quality graph. And I know that a lot of you are probably already familiar with the quality graph, but just to just quickly go over it, um, we have three things here. We have the grid in the background with this purple color. We have the wavy pattern and we have the curve. So what's happening with AutoStacker is essentially the grid is uh, the time frame from the left side to the right. So if we have a 1,000 frame file, um, over here on the left will be frame number one, and over here on the far right side will be frame number 1,000. And from the bottom to the top, we have the quality estimation. So the bottom left side will be frame number one, and quality will be very low, and at the top we have the high quality frames. So what's happening with AutoStacker? Once you have that video, uh, in AutoStacker uh, analyzed, uh, it, it gives up this, this graph. So we have the wavy pattern, which is essentially the quality of the frames, of the individual frames, as they were coming into the system. So you'll notice here we have all of these peaks going up and some peaks reaching all the way down. So this, these are basically our frames uh, in, 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 in sort of a random quality as they were coming in. So you have frame number one, maybe uh, quality one, frame number two, maybe quality five, and so on and so on. It's basically a, a randomness. So what's going to happen now is AutoStacker is going to take that, take that file, take all of those frames, and sort them with the best frames sort of collected uh, all the way to the front and the worst frames all the way to the edge of the file. So to quickly jump into AutoStacker, I have a video here that uh, I can show you. Are you still seeing my screen? Can you see uh, AutoStacker? Yep, we can see it. Okay. Remember, remember, we turn our mics off, so it always takes okay. us. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just making sure. Okay. Okay, so we're in AutoStacker now, and we have one file loaded in. So. Uh, in reality, what's what's, what should have uh, what you should have been seeing here is a much larger number. Um, if I've recorded, let's say, 80 files or 100 files, I would have opened all of them in AutoStacker at once, and this number would have been one of 80 or 100, or depending on the night. Um, and uh, what we can do here uh, in AutoStacker is, as you can see, this uh, this recording is a 640 by 480 um, region of interest. And because at this point, I don't, I'm not interested in any satellites or anything. All I want to know is the quality of my individual videos 
what I can do here is I can further crop down uh, the file. I can use these controls here to further crop down the video and it will speed up the alignment and stacking process. Obviously, if you're dealing with just one video, that may not be so important, but if you have a hundred, um, uh, you know, in batch mode, you wanna save your resources. So I'm gonna quickly go through the video here and just get an idea of uh, my seeing. And if, if you remember, uh, we're recording at speeds that are typically around the 200 FPS mark. So even when you're there looking at your screen, the feedback that you're getting is maybe 200 frames per second. So uh, especially when the seeing is not so good, you may not be able to tell that you have good frames coming in because the playback is so fast. So I'm just quickly going through the file here just to see what's happening. And it looks like there's some good frames in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let AutoStacker uh, go through it analyze it and see what we come back with. And this shouldn't really take long, uh, just a few more seconds. So I've selected planet here in AutoStacker. Obviously, if we were doing lunar imaging, I would have uh, selected surface, but I have it on planet. Um, and um, we also have an option here to um, uh, set the uh, noise estimation. And I, I left that on default because it's a pretty average night uh, for this file. It's not an exceptional night where I have a lot of details coming through the live feed. I would have set that lower if that was the case. And here's that graph that we saw before now that the analyze uh, part is done. So at this point, uh, I can see that uh, let me just quickly remind you that on the left side, we have the first frames, and on the right side, we have the uh, last frames uh, in the hey, wavy graph. Doctor? Yeah. Uh, some people on YouTube are requesting if you can zoom in your screen, like use Windows Magnifier, um, so they can see some of the smaller areas. Yeah, let's see if we can do that. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. So here's a graph for this video that we've just loaded in AutoStacker. And we can see if we focus on the wavy pattern, uh, you know, everything is random. There's some good frames followed by some bad frames, by some really bad frames, then some better frames. And now that we've analyzed it, uh, AutoStacker is giving us this green curve. So the uh, midpoint of the height if we look at the grid, is basically the 50% mark, where the quality is uh, at the 50% level of the total of the video. So I can see here that most of my video is has uh, frames that are better than the 50% mark of the total. So what I'm going to choose here is... Um, uh, uh, let me just remind everybody that at this stage, we have all the videos loaded in. I'm just not showing you this here on on, uh, on this window. But what I'm going to do uh, at this point is having loaded all of my files in and having gone through the analyze process, I'm going to go with a 50% um, frame percentage so that I can stack all of those videos with the same percentage and then go into uh, Registax. So that's what I would do at this point. Just select 50% and come over here and set my alignment points for the stacking process. So for my setup, um, remember I'm using a C9.25 schmidt cassegrain and uh, an ASI 224 camera uh, with a times two Barlow lens. So for my resolution, I like to use uh, alignment points that are somewhere around the 70 to 80 um, uh, size. And I like to place them uh, in places where there's obvious uh, contrast. So that would look like something like that, essentially, just placing my alignment points uh, along the main belts for Jupiter, giving them good overlap. Uh, avoiding the edges of the uh, of the planet, 
and just giving you know a good overall coverage with overlapping alignment points, maybe a few here at the top and over here. And remember, this is just the general reconnaissance stage where we're sort of aligning all of the videos that we got just to see where uh, in that large extended period of time we got those better moments of seeing. So I'm just going to go to uh, stack and I'm going to let our stacker do its thing. Now, if I had uh, 100 files here, this would take a good amount of time. Um, I think for my system, I can go through about 100 videos in maybe uh, just short of an hour, something like that. But obviously, we're not going to do this now. So I'm going to have to close Magnifier now. And uh, let's assume that we've completed this stage in AutoStacker and we've gone through all the videos. What, we're, uh, what we can do at this stage is go into Registax and begin going through all of those videos that we uh, stacked. I'll just go back to my presentation here. So we're going to go back to Registax and we're going to load all of those videos that we stacked and go through them with identical um, uh, processing uh, applied to them. And, and uh, the reason for this, again, is to maintain a sort of uniformity across all of those uh, files that we got. So the process in Registax is basically uh, just sharpening with, wa with the uh, Wavelet tool using a scheme and just uh, simple uh, RGB balancing and, and stretching and, and, and nothing further than that at this point. So let me just give you an example of the way I process. So I have uh, a file loaded here and I'm just gonna open up my histogram and my RGB balance tab. I'm just gonna click on auto balance. And again, you can see here how uh, this subframe is essentially uh, really green heavy. This is typical uh, of the uh, modern planetary cameras. Uh, where you have a lot of green bias. So I'm just going to go into auto balance and immediately you can see how that's cleaned up and the, the colors are much more natural. Uh, I could stretch at this point, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to go into wavelets. Uh, I like to use dyadic wavelets. And let me just pull up the zoom window here. I'm going to place this somewhere where we can see things a bit better. Okay. So I'm ready to go into wavelets. And uh, just to give you a quick description of wavelets, you can think of them as uh, brushes of different sizes from the coarse to the finer. So I typically, for my system, start with the halfway point, which is wavelet number three here. And I'm just going to give it a small uh, boost here. And we can immediately see how things are clearing up. And remember, we're just doing reconnaissance at this point. We're just looking to see what we got. Uh, and I'm just going to sort of sort my wavelets here. OK, so, <clears throat> so at this point, I can save uh, this wavelet uh, setting here as a scheme. So I'm going to save this. Let's just call it 1. I'm saving it. and. I'd like to uh, quickly mention here that I know a lot of people who uh, came up with a scheme at some point and they just use the same scheme again and again, uh, maybe even with different telescopes or for different targets or different cameras. And, and to my view, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to set the scheme based on uh, the data that you got for that night and for what you're doing, which part of the process you're in. So for this part of the process where we're just going through all of the files that we got, uh, I've saved the scheme as such. So I'm just going to um, save my image at this point and restart Registax because um, there's a sort of a bug in uh, Registax where when you apply the first scheme, uh, it, it's not going to save it unless you restart. So let's just save the image here uh, and 
restart to start going into um, the rest of the files. So what we're doing, let's just quickly restart. By going through all of those individual files, files that we got and using um, the schemes, let's, uh, you can see here, uh, these are all the stacks that came out of AutoStacker auto and we're just gonna go through all of them one by one. And all we're gonna be doing since we saved the scheme is we're only gonna be uh, balancing and we're just gonna select our scheme here. And there is the same amount of processing being applied to all of those subframes that we got. And the idea here is if we imagine that this is our data pool, all of these blue boxes here are essentially uh, the files that we got. The idea here is to apply the same kind of processing on all of them so that we can come up with something that looks like this, where we have an, um, sort of a categorization of those files based on their quality. And we got that by using the same processing. So having, going, having gone through all of the files using the same kind of uh, processing, we're gonna end up with something that looks like this. And from this, we want to isolate a string of continuous uh, good quality data. I got uh, you. Yeah. How did you assess the quality of those captures? Okay, so once you've gone through them, let me just jump into my folder here and show you what I mean. Uh, I'll jump into that fol folder we were looking at before. And it should be right here. Oh, sorry. Um, should be in here. Okay. So these are the uh, individual stacks as they came out of Registax. Uh, sorry, AutoStacker. After the Registax process, I save all of them and I'm gonna end up with something that looks like this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open them up and then just browse through them one by one. And I typically uh, just, you know, I just write down on a piece of paper uh, which ones look uh, sharper, which ones are the better ones. And you know, I'm just flicking through them at this point. Let me just zoom in a bit, a bit easier. Okay, so I'm just flicking through them and I'm writing down on a piece of paper uh, which ones look better. And uh, once I have uh, isolated uh, a group of better files, I select those files and this is where we're gonna start jumping, jumping back and forth. Uh, I'm going to isolate those files and then I'm going to go back to AutoStacker again and go through alignment and stacking again on those files, but I'm going to use stricter uh, stacking criteria. I'm not going to stack 50%. I'm going to stack maybe 20% or 10% depending on uh, the quality graph that I'm going to get from those files again, from those uh, better files. So after I've uh, stacked those better files again, I'm going to uh, reassess them in Registax one more time. I'm gonna apply a different scheme because now uh, the signal to noise ratio is different. Uh, before we had a 50% stack, so wavelets behave differently. Now I have a stricter uh, percentage of, uh, of stacks, maybe 10%. So if I use the same wavelet scheme, uh, the images are going to come up, you know, too, too sharp or too contrasty, or even, um, you know, they're not going to look, uh, as good as they should look. So I'm going to use a different scheme for that smaller group of files. And that's why I, I, that's why I said before that you shouldn't, stick to one scheme and just use the same scheme again and again. You wanna adapt the scheme to what you're doing. So uh, going through uh, those uh, better files in Registax again, we're going to redo stretching and sharpening. 
and we're going to end up with a small group of uh, files where we are ready to take those files and jump into WinJupos and do derotation. So just to quickly uh, sum up what we've done so far, we've acquired the data, we've acquired a large string of data using the fire capture auto run method, and we've uh, evaluated that large group of data and using the scheme fu function in Registax, uh, we were able to isolate a smaller string of good quality data, which we then re-aligned uh, and stacked, re-processed uh, in Registax, and we're ready now to take these files, this group of files, and combine them in uh, WinJupos in a process called derotation. So let's just quickly uh, jump into uh, WinJupos. I have it running here. So WinJupos is essentially um, it's a powerhouse of a software. It can do a whole lot of things. We're just going to concentrate on uh, derotating the data that we got. So I'm going to make sure I'm on Jupyter here. Okay. And what we're going to do is called uh, measuring the images that we got. So we have a folder of data. Uh, these are the better files that we got, that we found, and we've processed them identically. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take them in WinJupos and we're going to create measurements of those images. So let's just bring up image measurement. Okay. So at this point in WinJupos, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the date and time uh, for that image file that we've loaded in, as well as our own uh, longitude and latitude are correct. Uh, in the previous presentation, if you remember when we were going through fire capture, um, I sort of highlighted how you want to have WinJupos file naming clicked on. Uh, and the reason for this is becoming apparent now because we're going to be loading images into WinJupos. We don't want to have to worry about the precise date and time of those files. They're being immediately loaded into WinJupos from um, that selection in Fire Capture. And just making sure that we have our longitude and latitude uh, set in. Uh, the idea here is to take this uh, outline frame that we can see here and uh, place it over our planet with precision. And the way we can do that is we can go into the adjustment tab over here. And with Jupiter, um, WinJupos has um, a pretty accurate uh, automatic procedure. You just press F11 and it will sort of uh, lay it out um, with, with quite good precision, but you just want to double check anyway that you've placed the alignment, the uh, outline frame precisely over the planet. And I'll just zoom in here a bit, show you the controls for the outline frame. If I press page up and page down on my keyboard, I can enlarge the outline frame. I can shrink it with page down and I can rotate it by using the N keys and the P keys. So the idea here is to give WinJupos an indication of, first of all, which part of the planet we're looking at, because obviously planets rotate. That's why we want to have the precise date and time and our uh, geographical coordinates so that it can calculate exactly which part of the planet we were looking at at the time of capture. And we also want to uh, use this outline frame sort of to precisely let it know where we're looking at on the planet. So I'm just going to go and press F11. Okay, so it's uh, laid it out pretty precisely. I can also click on limb darkening compensation here and it will brighten up things and it will make it a bit easier for me to see where that outline frame is, is uh, placed. Uh, obviously now you can see the edge of the planet much better than before. And I'm just going to go and set it 
as well as I can. I think that should do. Okay, I'm gonna turn this off and I'm gonna go back to the image tab. And at this point, I can save this measurement. And I've already uh, done this, obviously. You can see my measurements here. And I'm saving this measurement and I'm gonna do the same process for all of those uh, better files that we got. Uh, I think they may, may be like 10 or 12 files. We're gonna do the same thing for all of those and we're gonna save those measurements. So once we've done that, the measurements uh, can then be loaded into uh, the derotation of images uh, tab here. So we're gonna take those measurements and we're gonna bring up this tool and we're going to add all of those. Let me just go to the right path here. Uh, okay. Over here. So these are my measurements for those files. And I'm going to select the ones that were continuous. Uh, that's fine. 2026 and all the way down to 2036. We have about 10 files here. 10 continuous files that we used and measured in WinJuPoss. Uh, let's just give it some time to load up. Okay, so at this point, what's gonna happen is uh, WinJuPoss is gonna take those 10 individual files, those 10 continuous good files that we've isolated from the entire data pool and by using the measurements that we uh, did for each one of those, basically it's going to blend all of those together and return uh, with one image, one image uh, made from all of those 10 images. So it's gonna stack them in a way, but it's uh, going to account for the rotation of the planet that happened between uh, those individual files. So, Let's just make sure everything uh, is loaded up. Okay, so we have the 10 files here. And at this point, I'm going to press compile and it's gonna uh, return with uh, a uh, combined result of those files. So uh, the idea is again, uh, going through all of those files that we got, uh, we've aligned them, we've stacked them, we've processed them individually, identically in Registax, and we've isolated that group of files, those individual uh, minute-long files. And in WinJupos, we're able to combine all of those files and come back with a single uh, uh, file containing the data from all of those good files with a much higher uh, signal to noise ratio. So uh, the completed image can then be loaded back into Registax one last time. And in Registax, we can uh, sort of push the wavelets a bit further. Let me just load a finished one um, and see if we can. Okay, so this one, this one here is, essentially, see how uh, it picked up on the wavelet scheme I had opened before? And because the signal to noise ratio is different, it's just returned with a, a really aggressive uh, and overstretched uh, view of Jupiter. I don't want that. We're gonna reset that. And we are going to uh, apply a different uh, set of wavelets for this stack of images. So oh, Agapios, could I remind yeah. you to use the magnifier? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Let's just bring that up. Oh actually I think in Registax we can do it from here. Um okay. It's the magnifier of the of the values you've got over there too. Can you see it? Um yeah. We, we can magnify the image, but we also need okay. to see Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Let's just pull up the magnifier. Okay. Um, all right. So for this um, uh, combined uh, data set, 
we're uh, typically going to be using uh, a much more subtle approach. We're barely going to use maybe wavelet number two and just a little bit of wavelet number one. And we can also use the denoise function here to just uh, sort of bring down some of the noise that we're going to uh, introduce by sharpening. And um, once we've done that, we can uh, save uh, the final uh, combined image and pull it up in Photoshop and, and go ahead and do our uh, final uh, processing steps, uh, our final uh, sort of cosmetic corrections. Uh, and at this point, you know, cosmetic corrections, uh, there's a lot of uh, subjectivity uh, as, as far as what looks good and what doesn't look good. Um, but at this point, I would typically only deal with uh, saturation, uh, color balance, balance, and just very, very slight uh, sharpening. And uh, that's essentially uh, the entire uh, processing um, aspect. I just want to highlight uh, again that the idea is to uh, gather large samples, uh, a large string of files, and use this sort of uh, uniform processing method to isolate the better parts and redo all of those good files using, uh, again, different uh, wavelet scheme, but the same for those individual files and uh, essentially combine them together in uh, WinJupos and come up with the final image result, which we can then um, uh, sort of um, play with in Photoshop to uh, uh, you know, make the most of the, of the night. Uh, and with this process, especially if we go back to how things were, um, you know, with older cameras and uh, back in the day when uh, we didn't have uh, something like fire capture, uh, one would have to sort of keep looking at the screen and uh, try and, and engage just by looking when things looked better. Um, but now uh, with this um, with this method, uh, we're using the method as sort of a, a sifter to uh, isolate those good files and combine them together with WinJupos and get back uh, a much higher uh, signal to noise ratio. Uh, and just to show you some examples, uh, these are um, single files up to maybe 120 seconds duration with 10, 10 frames per second with uh, an old webcam. And this is pretty much uh, the maximum sort of uh, quality and resolution that I could get from uh, the C925. But with uh, using this method, without changing the telescope, uh, uh, just by using a different method and a faster camera, um, the quality and the detail and the, res the resolution sort of shot up many, many levels. And um, just to uh, show you a few other examples, um, this is a 10 minute uh, string of data processed uh, with this method. Um, this is another set of data and, and these are uh, up to 20 minute total um, strings of data. And uh, let me remind you that um, I currently have uh, the major planets in low elevations. This was 2018, as many of you do as well. Um, uh, in 2018 here, I had Jupiter uh, for these images at a maximum altitude of 38 degrees. And still, uh, I've been able to uh, get uh, a good amount of detail coming through. Um, Again, uh, using the ASI 224 camera and the uh, atmospheric dispersion corrector that we talked about uh, in the previous uh, presentation. Uh, and of course, uh, Jupiter is, you know, uh, really dynamic. Uh, there's all kinds of things happening on Jupiter all the time. You have the moons uh, coming in and out of view. Uh, here you can see some uh, details coming through on the moons. 
Um, this is uh, Ganymede and Callisto, and you can see albedo features coming through uh, on both of them. Um, a wealth of detail on uh, the on the planet, uh, the Great Red Spot. Um, again here, and uh, and, and not to uh, just uh, talk about Jupiter, um, the other planets as well um, on Saturn. Uh, I started in uh, 2007, 2008 with uh, um, the webcam and, uh, you know, a typical uh, digital camera taking individual shots here in the top left. And I've progressed uh, through the uh, use of the webcam and the DBK camera and then the ASI cameras and this method uh, without changing the telescope, just by using a different method and a better camera you can see just how much better things have become. And Saturn is is not easy. Uh, for me, I find that Saturn is probably the most challenging uh, of the planets. Uh, obviously, it's uh, much dimmer uh, than the rest of the planets, of the major planets at least. And um, I find that even when I have good seeing, um, Saturn is just always much more challenging uh, to uh, and to process as well, not just uh, for capturing good images. Um, with Mars, uh, you can see the progression here from 2005 to 2018. Uh, again, these are all with uh, the uh, C925. Uh, the webcam images are here on the left and the ASI images here on the right. Uh, Mars, um, you know, a, a very dynamic uh, world as well. Uh, the last apparition, we had the uh, global dust storm that obscured uh, all of the planet just as it was coming into opposition. Um, and just before here on the second frame, just before the uh, dust storm occurred, I was able to get uh, some really good images, some really good data uh, from Mars. Uh, I think it was maybe 14 arc seconds uh, in diameter for uh, for this view over here. And uh, obviously the, the opposition day uh, at uh, 24 arc seconds, where you can see uh, a wealth of detail coming through. We have the ice caps, we have some uh, remaining uh, dust in the atmosphere and uh, um, just a lot of details uh, and these are all again with the c925 um, apart from the major planets i've also uh, attempted um, uranus and i've used a 610 nanometer uh, red filter here uh, on the c925 without the dispersion corrector because uh, uranus was much much higher so uh, these are if I remember correctly, yeah, okay. So these are one hour um, data. So these are continuous files um, for a total duration of an hour, uh, aligned, stacked, and combined uh, in WinJupos. And uh, I mean, Uranus is a tiny, uh, tiny world uh, in the telescope, maybe uh, three and a half arc seconds, somewhere there, but still you can see some detail coming through. Um, and uh, at this point, um, I'm just getting ready to go into uh, Venus imaging. I've just put together a sort of a poor man's uh, U-Venus filter by using a typical uh, number 47 violet and a uh, BG39 uh, filter double stacked. And I'm going to use these uh, on Venus, hopefully um, soon uh, in this apparition. Um, Venus is probably the only major planet that that I haven't uh, really explored in uh, in uh, in detail. Uh, I've only done some RGB uh, work on Venus, and I'm just getting ready to go into uh, attempting uh, by using this filter to maybe. Uh, see if I can get some uh, cloud details coming through. Um, I've also done some uh, lunar work uh, with the 925, uh, not uh, obviously not using 
the method that we described, these are just individual, um, um, I think maybe three or four minute files. Um, and again, uh, the nine to five, even though it's uh, hailed as a really good planetary uh, imaging telescope, it can also work for other things. Um, obviously here you can see some uh, lunar results that I did. And even though um, uh, it, there's some field curvature that it, it becomes apparent in, in large field fields, such as uh, when you're doing the moon, um, uh, I, I've still been able to get some uh, pretty good data. Um, and uh, you can see here in Plato, we have some craterlets coming through and uh, another shot here of Clavius uh, with some good quality. And these were done with the 610 nanometer red filter as well on the ASI 224. So essentially um, taking images uh, like this is, is great. It's a fantastic hobby, as we all know, uh, we're taking pretty pictures. But uh, when it comes to planetary imaging, uh, these images can have some um, scientific value as well. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, professional amateur collaborations going on. And just to highlight a few. Um, Agapio, the, yeah. before you get into that, there are a couple of questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. When you're using WinJupos, uh, do you have to have continuous uh, sets of data in order to do the derotation, or is there information in the stacks that allow it to do discontinuous? Oh, you mean if you have, let's say, uh, if you have gaps between those uh, individual files? Yes. Okay, so um, what you can do in WinJupos, let me just go back here. Um, okay, so what you can do in WinJupos, um, obviously here I have uh, a good string of uh, continuous files, but let's say I have a couple of gaps here. Let's say 2028 was a bad file and I'm not including it. Um, what you can do is you can load up uh, the immediately uh, previous and the immediately following files and you can derotate those two and sort of synthesize a missing frame. Uh, you can do that as well. How, how um, define continuous and discontinuous to me. Um, continuous means that each of those files that you've got there are one minute long, right? Yeah. With 200 frames per second? Yeah. So you've got, there's 1200 frames in the, each of those files. And so you processed them all out and stuff like that. When you say continuous, you mean that one was taken right after the other? Yes. Okay. Um, I couldn't come back from tomorrow's pictures and, and tomorrow's picture of Jupiter and put it in that stack and have it derotate. Uh, okay. So with, with, uh, with a planet like Jupiter, uh, what you can expect to see is, um, I mean, uh, as we know, Jupiter has a really quick rotation and has three different systems of uh, longitude. So what's happening with a world like Jupiter is today's uh, picture is going to be different to tomorrow's picture. Uh, there's things happening on the planets. They're not static targets. Mm -hmm. So you, you couldn't really do that. Um, okay, good. Yeah, that's, that's, I didn't know where that question was coming from. And I just wanted let to me just show you um, to that end. Let me just show you. Uh, How long do uh, we have to, to collect data before when Jupos really can't handle it? Meaning... I've gone up to, I've gone up to uh, 20 minute files. Let me just quickly show you something uh, in response to what we were talking before. 20 minute, uh, one minute files or 20 minute files. You can do both. Huh. You, you can you can shoot a continuous twenty-minute file, or you can uh, shoot strings of files uh, like the ones I'm, uh, I've shown you. But let me just show you a um, an example of of what we were talking about before. Um, 
where is it? okay so this is a collaboration with a french fellow uh, we were using the same setup uh, and we took um, uh, images of jupiter uh, in october 31st uh, november 10 and november 17 and these are uh, pretty much focused on roughly the same uh, longitude and you can see how different jupiter looks uh, between uh, those days okay Uh, should I uh, continue with? Uh... Oh, no, that, that, okay, I got that. Um, uh, let's see. I know, I, let me make sure that uh, Eric. Do we have all the questions? I have one myself. Do we have? Uh, all... Yeah, they're either answered okay. in YouTube or we've asked them. Yes. Okay. Um, all of the software that you've talked about, except Photoshop, is open source. Is free programming. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Everything is uh, is freeware. Except for Photoshop. And uh, um, please remind us what uh, kind of Barlow you're using. Uh, so I'm using, I'm still using my old uh, Celestron Ultima. Uh, this one, it's a, an apochromatic Barlow uh, times two. Um, I've also uh, occasionally used um, PowerMates and uh, stuff like that, but I sort of always go back to the, uh, this one. Uh, but you can have uh, great results uh, with any uh, apochromatic uh, Barlow lens. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, well, why don't you continue with your presentation? Yeah. If you have any more you want okay. to talk about? So uh, to, uh, to finish up, um, there's uh, a few professional amateur collaborations going on. Um, and you can participate uh, with your images. Um, there's the Juno Cam um, project from NASA, uh, where you can just submit your uh, your images, and they can be used to uh, sort of judge where uh, interesting things are happening on Jupiter, so that they can point the Juno Cam spacecraft uh, and take better images. Uh, there's the um, there's the impact flash detection project uh, going on, um, which uh, essentially is looking for um, comet or asteroid impacts uh, on the major planets. Uh, you can use it for Jupiter and Saturn at, at this time. And, 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 you know, we've all heard of uh, people such as uh, Anthony Wesley and whatnot. Well, these are people who are really frequently imaging and they were able to catch um, meteor, uh, sorry, comet or um, asteroid impacts on on the planets. And you can use uh, these uh, the software to basically um, go through your files. Uh, you can do it either in real time as you're recording, uh, or you can do it after you've finished collecting your files. And it will go through the, your uh, videos and it will scan for bright flashes and it's going to basically alert you to uh, the point in time where you have a potential flash and it will generate a report and you can send it to um, the program coordinator and hopefully uh, you'll be a uh, impact discoverer and you can also submit to uh, places like the british astronomical association or the association of lunar and planetary observers and have your images evaluated for potential scientific use. And that's something that uh, pretty much anybody can do, especially with today's equipment. We're all getting um, pretty good data that can be scientifically useful. So I highly recommend that you uh, look into that. So that's pretty much it. Thank you for uh, your time. If there's any questions. Thank, thank you for your time, because you put a lot of effort into that, and I really appreciate it. And I want to remind everybody that Agapios volunteer to do that. We asked people, and um, uh, Eric asked one night, and the next day we got a message from Agapio saying, hey, you know, I heard you, I'll, I'll volunteer. So um, we really appreciate that extra effort. That's what keeps the Astro Imaging Channel going. So please 
get something in here. Eric, how are we doing on other questions? Anything else going over on YouTube? Well, nothing's come up in the last few minutes. Okay. Well, then I think we're going to be calling it a night. Um, we can go back to our regular watching the virus, I guess, or whatever we do nowadays. Um, I, everybody's under the, the weather, meaning it uh, seems like the United States, at least, has a lot of clouds over it right now. So at any rate, thank you very much, Gapios, for being here. We'll see you all next week. Uh, Deborah's coming next week, right? Deborah Saravola is going to tell us about some of the changes she's seen in imaging over the over the years and uh, she's going to be telling us that the week after that frank will be telling us about meta guide and the week after that one of you will be volunteering to have a program for us so we really appreciate it thank you all toga take us out good night everybody did you say we're out toga nope okay